Thanks for joining us here with Lower to Live. I'm here with Ray Lovett and really excited to be here. But before we actually go on, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands we're all on today. This is being shot on Ngunnawal and the Gambri land. And I want to pay my respects to elders past and present. Extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are with us and everyone else for joining us. So Ray, I'm going to introduce you and then you can uh, fill in any blanks that I have missed because you have an illustrious career. But I just want to start with your mob. I think that is really important to get right. Can you just say it again for me? Yeah, so I come from the Nyampa people. Nyampa people. Yeah. And where, where is your mob? Uh, so we sort of extend from almost towards Broken Hill uh, yeah. in western New South Wales, right up to Cobar um, in the northwest of New South Wales and down towards, um, I guess, uh, Lake Angelico as well. Fantastic. Yeah. And you're at the ANU, the Australian National University, and you're leading the Microwise study. Yeah, so the Microwise study I've been working on for six years so far. Um, and we started that work in conjunction with uh, IATSIS, the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Um, and we also started working with the Lower Institute as well, which is how I became involved with the Lower Institute. Fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit more about your journey prior to what we've just explained? Yeah, so I've had a few careers, as you mentioned. So I started out life, I finished high school and went straight into university uh, where I studied nursing. Um, and then I actually came to Canberra, uh, where, you know, where I live now, to work as a nurse in the Canberra Hospital. Um, and then I moved north, back out to the bush uh, in the New England region. And I actually worked out there uh, by day as an Aboriginal health worker and by night as a nurse in aged care. Um, and then uh, after a little while, I took on the Aboriginal health worker role full time um, for a couple of years. And then I got recruited by the chief nurse in New South Wales hmm. to go and develop uh, the statewide strategy for increasing the number of Aboriginal nurses in New South Wales. So I worked in the chief nurse's office for four years as well. Wow, fantastic. And how did you get into research? Uh, well, research came about uh, really when I was working as an Aboriginal health worker. One of the projects we were working on was a, a prevalence study around uh, type 2 diabetes in the New England area. And so I was part of this research team that had to survey a local mob around uh, symptoms and signs and stuff like that. And so I got really interested uh, from there. Uh, I sort of maintained that and kept that going while I went and worked in the policy arena. Um, and then when my policy time came up, I, got, I was really particularly interested in the stats side of things, uh, the numbers. So uh, I saw this advertisement for what was called the Masters of Applied Epidemiology at the ANU. So, I applied, uh, was successful, so I relocated to Canberra to do that master's degree and from there that's really where my full-time research career has been. Fantastic. Started. And how did you first become involved with the Lowitcher Institute? Um, so I'd been involved in a couple of different ways sort of early on. So I was, uh, when I, after I'd finished my master's, I was working at IATSIS as well in, in one of their research teams. And Lowitcher Institute um, was actually, had a couple of offices in IATSIS at that time. So I remember talking to people like Mick Gooder um, and Arnie Pat then as well. And I got involved in a panel where they were going for research funding. Uh, so I got involved there, somehow drawn in. I think uh, <laughs> uh, like a lot of us, we get drawn into Lowitcher. Um, and so ever since then, I've been involved on and off. And then while I was a student doing my PhD, I actually, uh, we did a project between uh, IATSIS and the Lowitcher Institute where we were evaluating the NHMRC ethics guidelines. Yeah. And so that's where my involvement really ramped up. I think that's actually where I met you maybe yep. for the first time. Yep. Yeah. 2012, I think that was. It's a while ago. <laughs> so you said you liked the numbers, but what actually excites you more generally about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research? Um, I, th I think for me, the sort of, the really exciting part about research is uh, I always come up with these ideas in my head. Um, and I guess if you're working for someone else, 
<laughs> it's really hard to prosecute your ideas or to uh, run away with those ideas. Um, whereas in research, if, you, if, it, if it is a good idea, you can test that idea. And if you can test it and then people see value in it, um, you might be able to apply for funding to investigate further. So I think it's that whole process of coming up with an idea, which is essentially where my QI came from, um, that people haven't necessarily thought about, and it's prosecuting that process through, you know, commitment essentially over a long period of time. Um, and so it's about those ideas, really, and testing those ideas. That's the exciting thing for me. Yeah, no, that, that is, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, it's the exploration, isn't it? Yeah. The, the journey that you go on from a concept into yeah, a deep absolutely. dive. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, even though my QI has been going six years now, I still wake up every day thinking about the kinds of things that we could do and the new information and the new kinds of ideas that we might be able to create out of this study. So tell us a little bit more about Mike Hawaii. So it, 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 the initial idea was, uh, it comes from you know very personal experience for many of us, I think, in that um, you know if, if we are sort of solid in our identity, know where we come from, who we belong to, um, and those sort of cultural uh, concepts, um, if we live that way, uh, if we think that way, then that actually helps improve our health and well-being. And so, being an epidemiologist, you kind of, what's the way I can bring those two things together? And being a bit of a data nerd, um, you know, I already knew how to really count health conditions and those sorts of things. But also, then the really exciting process for me was spending, you know, two and a half, three years going around to all different Aboriginal communities, organisations, talking to different people all over the country to sort of formulate these concepts around what is culture, what is our identity, how do we participate in our culture, how do we learn about our culture and doing all those sorts of things and talking to many, many people. Yeah. And then developing a set of questions, very simple questions around that and then linking that with the information about health and wellbeing and then understanding that relationship. The other thing that's really interesting about Mike Hawaii is the governance structure. Do you yep. want to have a little chat about that? Yeah, so it was very important from the start that um, this be led, developed, led and managed by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, you know, I'm one person um, with a particular skill set that I can bring to this kind of stuff. There are many, many other people who are my peers, who are my seniors, elders, um, who uh, have guided us over this six years. Um, and it's a cultural way of working. The very thing that we're talking about in understanding in this process is how do we engage Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the management of a data set and information that is, goes to the very core of us. Um, and so it was really important to have, I think it's 11 organisations that wow. sort of oversee the study um, and um, working with communities as well that want to work with us and uh, you know that reciprocity, reciprocity around giving information back to communities. Um, so we have a lot of obligations in terms of our governance. That's the study running itself. Then, you know, I'm also a proponent of what we call Indigenous data sovereignty. And for me to be a proponent of that, I have to operate that way as well. So as a part of the process, how we govern the data that is from the 10,000 people, more than 10,000 people that have participated already, how do we protect their information? They retain ownership of it. Mm. They are entrusting us with that, the care of that data. And so again, that places obligations on me and the team that, that I work with um, about handling that information in a sensitive way. Yeah. In the right way. You mentioned Indigenous data sovereignty. Do you want to just unpack that a little bit? Because it might be new for some people. Yeah, so Indigenous data sovereignty, like sovereignty itself, is, is about ownership and self-determination. So in terms of information or data about us, it's about any information or data about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and whether, whether we retain ownership of that and therefore are able to consent 
to the use of information a certain way? Or if, if we can't own things, can we put a governance process mm. over those data sets to protect our interests? So there's two, th two things really. Do we own it? And if we don't own it, how do we protect it? Mm. Fantastic. So, I mean, obviously, uh, Mike Y and other work that you've done has got a large number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people involved yep. in the research. Yep. What do you think the value is specifically for having Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people involved in research that impacts us? Uh, well, it, it's everything. Um, I can't do the work that I do without uh, other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers being involved, uh, but also, more broadly, individuals and community. Uh, uh, my research does not exist without that. Yep. Um, so it's crucial. Fantastic. So you mentioned before about, uh, you know, epidemiology sometimes seems to focus on the comparison between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people mm -hmm. and non-Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. um, what else gets in the way of us just doing good work? Uh, well, um, there's many things. <laughs> <laughs> many things. Um, I think a really important one, um, so just from personal experience, is the so if I go right back to being much younger than I am now, um, it's that first in family yeah. kind of thing uh, in terms of high school, university, working in an academic institution. So I was still, the seven siblings, I was the first to finish high school and to go into university. Yeah. Um, so the, the normalization around those pathways for us, uh, and also in school, that manifested in, you know, the year advisor and other people not necessarily thinking that, you know, I could uh, think about university as an option. Um, so it starts way back there. Um, and then in academic institutions themselves, and I believe this still exists today, that um, there is an undercurrent of racism around uh, our intellectual abilities um, and achievement that we uh, seem to be not capable of achieving the same as others. Um, and even as a staff member now, I still believe that there, are so, there is some of this thinking in these institutions mm. and that um, we are only there to placate, you know, this um, notion of um, the system giving us a hand up when clearly I often point out we are in these systems and these institutions despite them. Yeah. Yep. I wish they could all attend the Lowitcher conferences <laughs> and actually just sit and listen at those, because if they did that, mm. they would be in awe of the wealth of knowledge and experience yep. that our mob bring. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I appreciate yep. what you're saying. I'm first in family as well. Yep. How important do you think then is it for the next generation of researchers coming through to have more people like yourself actually basically role modeling research? Yeah, it's, a, it's the other big part of my research that I, I focus on in addition to, you know, doing work like my Kauai, is I have, uh, I place a huge emphasis on the work I do in bringing the next generation with me. Um, so where I work in my unit, there's uh, a number of masters and PhD students. So uh, I bring through masters of applied epidemiology students now, they work with me. Um, there's usually one or two of those a year that come through our unit. And at the moment we have five PhD students studying in, wow. in our unit as well. Um, so, you know, I have that obligation as well about uh, growing that next generation and, you know, I'm not going to be around forever and it'd be nice to no. keep bringing people through. No, yeah. fantastic. Although the thing about academia is as long as your brain's working, you actually don't get to retire. Well, that's right. I always talk about never wanting to retire. Um, so I, I like that thought, but, you know, depends how the system treats you. Yep. And how do you personally overcome some of the barriers that you're faced within the research and academic sectors? Um, for people that know me, they would understand I'm a very persistent person. I can be very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> um, no one would ever say that about you, would they, right? <laughs> Um, I, uh, one of my supervisors in my master's um, uh, complimented me. I thought it was a compliment. She might have thought it was something <laughs> else. In that I will always find a way to do something, okay. um, you know, no matter how many obstacles are put in, put in the road. So, yep. yeah, I'm quite determined and quite uh, persistent. 
think as a black folly you almost need to be. My mum always said, where there's a will, there's a way. That's right. Well, my favourite saying is persistence beats resistance. Ah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> Wear them down. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Fantastic. What's one of the favourite things, like your take-home messages uh, for young people who are coming up? What's one of your favourite things about research? Why would, you know, what would attract people to the research space? So when we think about the future, everything we talk about, whether it's political, whether it's social, whether it's economic, is founded in some way on research um, and good evidence. So, you know, the, the very things that um, we aspire to achieve for the future um, is usually, usually at the end of that information or that advice yes. as well about research um, in growing that next generation. And so it, research or, you know, coming to understand or producing knowledge um, is the way of the future. Um, and so you can't really lose in terms of career or impact uh, in research, uh, particularly if you're focusing on society more broadly, which is what I like to think about, um, and how do we improve society. Um, yes, it makes you feel good, but then it's much bigger than you. And I think that's really nice. And young people, uh, or people younger than me, um, you know, I think a lot of younger people this generation now is really interested in that sort of stuff. Um, and so research can really deliver on that. Yeah. You just talked about, um, you know, benefiting society. What can non-Indigenous society learn from us that would benefit them, do you think? Uh, a lot of things. Yeah. Um, so the, the old persistence, uh, <laughs> for one, um, but also uh, about working together in a collective. I think that, um, you know, uh, the rest of society could learn a lot in, mm. in that way about how we work together, how we govern things, how we make decisions whether that's within a family, within a community and for society, um, and how we do that in terms of respecting our elders, the people with all that knowledge. Um, and I, I do worry that um, what we consider Western society, um, you know, we've had a couple of commissions recently that tell us uh, about the value we place on our old people and how they contribute it to our society. So I think there's a lot people could learn from there. The recent bushfires, again, indigenous knowledges in this country are coming to the fore about how we manage our environment and our landscapes. Um, there's so much. I, could, I, could, I get yep. a sense that you've got this long <laughs> list of things. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't disagree with you. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add about research in particular that really, you know, you want to share with the rest of the community? Um, uh, yeah, I guess it's, probably not about research. Okay. Um, you know, so re research is one aspect and research can be used and has been used in the past to uh, provide particular evidence, shall we call it, um, about individuals and society. Um, but I think one of the good aspects of research um, is about crit critiquing or taking a critical look at research and I think our society more broadly would, would benefit from this sort of critical thinking approach and embedding that in our families and communities. I know in the, that's actually one of the big uh, things I see in the community, that particularly the Aboriginal community, is that sort of critique and look at what people are saying in terms of evidence. So we should always be cautious about what stats and what um, advice people are throwing out at us. Um, and really take a critical look at that. Use our research eye, but also use our community eye to that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us. It's been great. Thanks so much.